I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Menthian, and welcome to this edition of The Extra Podcast. Today, we're talking about the impact of the coronavirus shutdown on the local and really the, the world's uh, music scene and how it impacts Memphis musicians. To that end, we're joined by Elizabeth Kaywine, Executive Director of Music Export Memphis. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, your mission, and I, 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 don't, I didn't memorize this, I wrote it down, but I was looking at your site. Your, your mission, Music Export Memphis, creates opportunities for Memphis musicians to showcase their music outside the city, driving tourism, talent attraction, economic development, and giving artists a needed engine and platform to grow their careers and elevate Memphis's profile as a contemporary music city. A lot of that seems impossible in a shutdown, in a pandemic. Yeah. How, how is it going? Let's start with the musicians you work with. And we talk about y'all as an organization, but I mean, first and foremost, you're there to, as you would say, I think, to support those musicians. And it's just, everybody's been hit hard, but boy, I can't imagine. Yeah, it is. Um, the way that I've been describing it since about March is that the loss is catastrophic. Um, so in, in mid-March, we really took a complete pivot. I'm sure that's the word of the, of 2020. Everyone's pivoting. Um, and we started fundraising for a COVID artist emergency relief fund. And we started distributing grants from that fund in April. But what, what's been, and, and I can talk in a, in a second about some of the results of that, but to answer your question about the state of things, what was reported to us in that application process was income lost. Um, and we were at that time, particularly early on, we were talking to people only about canceled gigs. So that's what's going to make this number even more disturbing because you're not talking about the sort of opportunity cost of this entire mess, right? We're not talking about future gigs that never got You're talking only about things that people had on the books. And of the 295 musicians or music industry professionals that we granted out to, the loss was $2.4 million. Um, and again, we're, we're talking about, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, those grants were distributed between April and June. That is only that loss. And what we know now is that this is going to continue for a long time, right? Potentially into, you know, potentially a full year from now. I certainly hope it's not that long. But, you know, the entire live music economy shut down uh, and, and as it had to, right? It's not, right. it's not safe. What we also know now is that singing is a super spreader event. Well, there I was about to say, it's just... It's, it's really, it's, no, there's really no safe way for people to even rehearse together, um, much less perform in front of an audience of people. So it's incredibly difficult to imagine what bringing the live music economy back could even look like. And for people maybe who aren't as close to it, maybe go to a show or like music or, you know, most people listen to music in their home. They Spotify, they use iTunes, they use whatever. Pre-COVID times, I think, I think a lot of people are, don't realize how, other than the really really wealthy, top-tier musicians. Um, musicians make their money off live events, by and large, now. It is not off the downloads. It's not off the streaming services. It's not off the YouTube videos. It is, it is live gigs, even to the point of a, um, like an Amy Mann, who some people might know, but I mean, she's done soundtracks. She's very well-known, incredibly well-regarded. I remember a couple years ago, an article about her and talking about how really for her to, oh no, it was actually it was Liz Fair. Excuse me, I get them confused. It was Liz Fair and her, people have heard of Liz Fair. She's had award-winning albums. She's really well known. Her income is dependent on constant touring, even 20, 30 years into her career. Absolutely. I mean, I could do a, a series of lengthy podcasts about this topic alone. Um, but the, the thing that's really been, the phrase that's really been sitting in my head the past couple of days is, it doesn't take an earthquake to, to notice cracks in a foundation, but you can't ignore them anymore after the earthquake happens. And I feel like the, the, this crisis, this moment has really illuminated so many things about our ecosystem that are terribly broken. And one of those is musicians reliance on the gig economy. They don't have enough access to lifetime income streams, which would be royalties, um, you know, publishing, things like that. And what was, particularly distressing for me in reviewing applications for this COVID relief fund was seeing Memphis musicians list out, you know, canceled gigs and listing out 20 to 25 canceled gigs and then associating a total dollar amount that they would have earned from those gigs. And it would have been $2,500, $4,000, 
from 20 nights of work conceivably, right? Because unfortunately the per gig amount that musicians are paid has not dramatically changed in the last 30 years while inflation and spending power have changed dramatically. So no, I mean, not only are they relying on the gig economy, there is no, there's no rainy day fund, there's no insurance, there's no savings, um, there's no cushion. And so when that goes away overnight, again, I mean, catastrophic is truly the only way to describe it. Do that, let's do that math again because it is profound. And, yeah. it's, and I, I think from knowing you and from other people in Memphis who are closer to the music industry than I am, I was startled when I learned these kinds of numbers. So yeah. here's a, a band that had 25 gigs, 25 shows scheduled. They were gonna take home $100 per show. Is that $100, per musician? $100 per musician per show. Per, per, per musician per show. Right, but it's it, that's still a disturbing fact, and actually, well, I, no, it is. It's it's incredibly disturbing. Yeah, that's why I want to slow down and think about that because I don't think people realize that because they go to the show and they pay ten bucks or fifteen or twenty bucks to get in, and they buy a bunch of beer and they buy a bunch of you know sprites or whatever the hell they're buying, heck with they're buying, and they buy a t-shirt and, so, and then a hundred bucks a show. Right. Well, I would encourage them to buy a t-shirt because that money is going to go straight to the band. So they should yeah, definitely always do that. Um, but yeah. And, you know, and when you think about spending power, I wrote a column actually about this very topic for the Daily Memphian, one of my playlist columns that I write every month. Um, I think it was back around the beginning of the year, just sort of saying we have to, this is something we have to fix in 2020, of course, not knowing, you know, what we were going to be up against. And John Horniak, who um, is a longtime figure in the music community here, um, has run a studio, is a musician, and is, uh, for, for many years now, has run our Recording Academy chapter. He reached out to me and said, you know, the, the thing about your column is, yes, we were getting paid $100 a man in, and I can't remember what year he said, but it was certainly 25 or 30 years ago. But then he said, my rent that I was paying was... I think it was like $250 a month. So, and I really felt like for me, even though I'm I'm in this world and I know these facts, when he framed it in that way, it was, that was a real eye-opening moment for me to realize that, yeah, okay, you got $100 a night, but after two, three gigs, your rent was paid. You actually could save money. Yeah. You actually could right. pay your bills. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it hasn't changed and, and it has to. Yeah. Did, um, when they did the big unemployment relief extension package, which just expired, what, a week ago, and is still being fought over, um, there was some accommodation for gig workers of, you know, sort of the Uber drivers of the world and the Lyft drivers and the, the, the people who typically, historically, didn't get unemployment benefits. Did that apply to musicians? Musicians don't have an employer, so I think traditionally the unemployment insurance didn't apply to somebody who didn't have an a actual employer. Right. And the other thing that's difficult is that so much uh, it's a it's a cash economy and that a lot of things are not on the books by virtue of kind of the way things work. It also is that's part of what makes it really hard ever to quantify what what the loss looks like from an industry standpoint, yeah. because so much of it is not documented or reported. Um, but I know from the musicians that we work with that many of them did apply for and get unemployment benefits. Now, yeah. what I can't say for sure, because so many of them have have a variety of revenue streams when you have to. So it may have been that those those people were also teaching and they were able to use that. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that they did they did sort of broaden it and I know a lot of the musicians we work with were able to access that. Yeah. Uh, talk about the 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 relief fund. What, yeah. What, what is that? What was that? How did that come about? So it's ongoing. Basically, in mid-March, I just sort of realized, you know, our our programming is not going to exist um, as long as live music can exist, and we have a responsibility to fill gaps in our ecosystem and serve our musicians. So we have to figure out how to do this. So we started fundraising. Uh, as I said, we were able to start giving grants out in April. We did this in partnership with Arts Memphis, um, really just to kind of grow the pot that we had access to and also to leverage Arts Memphis um, kind of backend resources for application, for applications, uh, evaluation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we granted out, uh, to date we've granted out more than $190,000 to wow. 295 individuals. We paused after our sixth round of granting in June because the bank just got too low. We don't have, we didn't have enough in the coffers, but 
we've just launched a virtual uh, concert series that is raising money and we will we should be ready to reopen for at least another round of applications within the next month so we're just going to keep working to refill the pot and as soon as we i kind of have a threshold that i always want us to get back to as soon as we get back to that we'll just reopen to more applications and um and try to keep relief flowing out and we've we've applied for some cares funds as well to try to to throw in there but um our goal is that is and and what we will continue to work toward regardless is that we can keep relief flowing as long as it is needed the um the the shows the live shows talk a little bit more about those and and how people can uh, learn more about them yeah so the relief series is called hold on we're coming uh and it is basically every other friday night it started in july and it'll last through the fall so i don't know when this podcast is going to go live but the we've got one on august 14th with ben yeah. nichols um and we've we've got these folks performing live from different music spaces throughout the city uh so he's gonna be at the high tone the new high tone on cleveland uh in their new location we'll have uh, another one on the 28th with Unapologetic. And then in September, we've got Marcella Simeon and Taliba Sophia performing from Slim House. So um, those, all that ticket information is available at musicexportmemphis.org slash COVID. Or if you head to our Facebook page, any of our social media at yeah. Music Export MEM, you can find that info. And how are you doing the, the event? Are they no audience events, basically? I mean, no live audience stream. events, yeah, they're live stream, but they're ticketed. So you have to pay 10 bucks uh, and then you're, you receive the sort of private live stream link to get to watch the show. Yeah, um, well, I have more questions on that, but let me just take a minute to say that the Extra Podcast is one of many weekly podcasts we do here at The Daily Memphian, including the podcast version of Behind the Headlines, which goes up every week, as well as shows on politics with Bill Drees, uh, food with Jennifer Biggs. Uh, we're getting back to some sports podcasts as uh, the Grizzlies come back. Uh, all of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site. They're on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And one quick uh, promotion, we're going to be doing uh, our small business seminar. We normally do these uh, events in person at the Brooks, focused on all kinds of things. Obviously, we're not doing anything in person right now, but we're doing a virtual small business seminar focused on how small businesses are navigating COVID and the shutdown and just the, the, the difficult economic circumstances. That is coming up on September 10th um, at 3 p.m. And there'll be more information on the site and coming your way. So thank you. Um, back to you. Uh, do you despair some days over this? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, a lot. I think, I, I think really I was in a pretty deep pit when we first started getting the applications in. And I, I could see the, the dollar figures, all the zeros, the loss. Um, it really hit me. And I think, um, though I, though I grow more at ease and, and comfortable with the, the sort of unknowns personally every day, I think I really, it just, it pushes me to try to figure out how we can continue to do our mission and continue to support artists in a space where we don't know, you know, indefinitely live music does not exist. Um, and so that's something that our board is working on. How do we create experiences with music uh, to sort of fulfill that side of our mission of promoting our city, but also how do we get money in musicians' pockets? And to be honest, this concert series has been one way that we can do that. We, we were actually able to divert some program funds that we knew we weren't gonna spend to pay the artists who are performing in the series to then let those funds raise go back to COVID relief. So, you know, just trying to continue to figure out how we can promote Memphis music, but everything we do always puts money in an artist's pocket. And, and it's important for us to figure out how to keep doing that uh, until we, we can get back to some new version of normal. In normal times, so people who aren't familiar with, uh, with what you all do, in, in normal times, what were you doing? And then we'll talk a little bit of how that might change going forward. But yeah, so what, what did you do? I mean, up until March of 2020, how did yeah. you occupy your time, Elizabeth? <laughs> yeah, we have three core programs. Um, the first one's called Experiences. Essentially, we go to other places and we throw Memphis parties. That's the easiest way to describe it. We um, bring a bunch of bands or artists. We bring usually Memphis food and beer and uh, all sorts of other Memphis culture stuff. Um, and we create Memphis experiences. Those are at festivals and conferences, but they're also pop-ups in other places. Our second program is called Ambassadors. It's just tour support. Memphis artists who meet certain qualifications. The biggest one is you have five or more dates. You can apply for a grant 
tour support from us. Um, we mobilize them as social media ambassadors. That's really their sort of payment back is they use certain hashtags or they post about what it means to them to represent Memphis and, and we give them money to help them get on the road. Um, and our final program is called the Export Bank. It just kind of helps us say yes to opportunities for musicians we were able to send uh, an artist to Sundance actually in January to perform because we had a connection who said, hey, we've got a slot if you can get her here. And, and that program just kind of lets us say yes to those opportunities. So those are our three buckets. Um, and up until March, I mean, in January, we, we went to Folk Alliance International with an amazing roster of artists and put on an awesome show, um, took Memphis beer and coffee and food and obviously tons of Memphis music. And we were funding artists for tours. Um, you know, we had artists that we had funded for tours even in April, May, June that of course were then canceled. But um, yeah, those are those are kind of our core programs. It's all about creating an opportunity for somebody to get on the road and, and do what they do very well. And, and frankly, what they're already doing. We just help them do it more effectively and with a little more cash in pocket. And you very much work with, um, I mean, you are not out there I don't think you're anti Elvis, but you're not out there promoting Elvis and Sun Studios and and some of the you know stacks and so on. Really, I mean, you're you're supporting new and, and working musicians. And again, I don't mean that in a that came across more negative. That's my words, not yours, right? But it is. I was always struck by that. I mean, you've been on behind the headlines. It seems like a hundred years ago now. It wasn't that, but um, and we've you know you've done columns for us and so on. It, I'm struck by this active effort of existing working musicians. Um, again, maybe built on the legacy, maybe not of Saks and, and all these other places, but um, that's always been your focus, right? Absolutely, 100%, um, both as an organization and also me as a person, uh, uh, that's sort of been my North Star is how can what we do make uh, life better for working musicians, make Memphis a city of choice for working musicians? And also I think really important to me is that the world understands that we are still a hub for contemporary new innovative music making, that that has not changed. You know, the level of talent here over the years has not changed. I think I wouldn't trade our music legacy and history for anything in the world. I'm so deeply, deeply proud of it. but what it what it does is it provides an entry point for a lot of people and i think that if we don't seize that right if we don't um and we see this the most at a conference we go to called americana fest which is really that intersection of american roots music so we get tons of people who know memphis because they know sun because they know stacks because they know elvis and they come to discover what's going on in memphis now but that legacy was their through line that was the thing that piqued their interest and then we're able to open up and say well hey, here's what's going on now in Memphis and all these new artists that you can discover. Um, and lots of cities don't have that, uh, you know, to be able to build on. So we're definitely grateful for that. But if we don't, if we don't do things to create opportunity, um, I always say, no matter who you are, or what line of work you're in, you want to go where there's opportunity. So we're focused on building opportunity for artists, again, so that this, this city can be a city of choice for musicians and celebrated as such. Um. The, do you think your mission will change when, when we get back to some semblance of normalcy, right? And we all know that it, it won't be completely the same, but some semblance of normalcy uh, where the, the virus is under control, live music, bars, et cetera, not just here, but everywhere can be, people can be back there safely in some form or fashion. Do you think your mission will change or will you get back to what you were doing pretty much as it was? I don't think our mission will change. I think that our tactics will change and we are already talking about that. And I think it's actually not, change is maybe not the right word, but evolve and grow. Uh, you know, if I'm gonna point a finger at the music ecosystem and say, you know, this thing is broken because musicians are only able to make money through gigs, through the experiential economy, um, that's what everything we did was built around, right? And we have to be smarter about finding ways to fulfill our mission of exporting Memphis music, of elevating our city's profile as a contemporary music hub. We can do all that without actually hosting a live music event. So I think that we will, the second it is safe to do so, I will be so excited to throw events again and to welcome people to experience our music because the fact is that will always be an unbeatable, truly top number one way for somebody to discover 
rediscover our culture. You can't replace that. But in the meantime, what our board is working on is what does it look like for us to try to do more that, again, is still a fit for our mission, still is focused on exporting music, but is maybe more connected to building lifetime income streams. So is connected to helping artists say with licensing or sync for TV and film, or it's connected to helping them get on a Spotify playlist or helping do PR for their record. You know, all of those things still fit our mission, but there's things that can happen outside of the live music industry. Uh, you know, do you, do you worry? I, I hate that being negative today. Cause I'm, I, I, but you know, it's just a really un, a difficult time. I, we were talking before this. I mean, it's just so difficult in so many industries. Um, you know, even when the virus is under control and the pandemic is under control, we're in a recession, a pretty serious one. It's, it's not going to bounce right back. And again, we talk about this lack of economic support for working musicians. You are also, as an organization, uh, you know, you're fundraising and you're dependent on philanthropic dollars. I mean, do you, do you, do you feel you can, how do I want to say that? I mean, do you, how much does that worry you? I guess is the question. It definitely does. We have seen our um, philanthropic funding cut across the board uh, from all funders who would fall into that category. Not completely. We're not, you know, we're not zeroed out, but we've seen it cut. Um, the strange thing for us is because we're running this massive, you know, emergency fund, our, our annual operating budget actually will probably be uh, bigger this year than it, than it was in, in 2019. Um, or definitely will be. So it's an odd thing. I think that I worry about 2021. I worry about how we, um, I think we're fine right now. I worry about how we sustain in the future. What I hope, uh, be ever the optimist that I am, I hope that maybe that this moment can cause a pendulum to swing. And, you know, as we have had this, so many of these things, again, it just kind of all falls into that experiential economy space. Those, those things have been ripped away from us. I hope that that will cause us to kind of remember or realize how much we value them and how important it is to pay for them. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, our music venues are in big trouble. 90% um, of them reported that if the shutdown lasted more than six months and they got no federal assistance, 90% said that they would have to close permanently. Um, those were the local venues. That you those served? were yes, independent venues across the country. Yeah, from through the oh, national across the country, across yeah, the country. Yeah, yeah. through the National Independent Venue Association. So n imagine, I mean, ninety percent of independent music venues, and that's a huge piece of the sort of supply chain of the music industry, and it's a huge piece of artist development. I mean, the face of our of our uh, music. I hate to use the word industry in that sense, but really, our music ecosystem is going to be forever changed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at you just look at tourism and you look, I mean, not to, but to talk about it in sort of broad economic terms. I mean, some of this falls into tourism. It's obviously a huge part of Beale Street. It's a huge part of what hospitality dollars and so on. And, and I think we had Kevin Kane from the, what do they call it now? Memphis travel, the CVB on uh, behind the headlines a er, hundred years ago in April. And I mean, I think it's one third of the jobs in Tennessee are dependent um, you see what's going on in Nashville, where Nashville has forced itself open with mixed results and uh, a lot of difficult situations happening up there. They've got a whole economy that's very dependent on having music and events and bars and hayrides going on downtown. Um, you just sort of see that, I mean, the, 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 it's just another angle on this terrible thing economically that's been happening and how cities and, and venues are, are struggling to make it. Um, Briefly, before we wrap up, you're going to have a new, you're going to have a show on the new radio station, WYXR. Uh, yeah. We're as a partner in that. Um, I'm a board member of the new entity. Uh, I have to disclose I'm not writing. Um, and this podcast will shift over there and be a, a show on YXR when it launches in October. What are you going to do? Uh, you're doing a weekly show? Yeah, it's going to be Tuesdays at one o'clock. Um, title still working. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a music export Memphis show, obviously it will be all contemporary Memphis music. So if anyone who is listening to this is feeling like, well, I didn't know that there was that much happening just Tuesdays at one tune in because I will be playing an eclectic mix of new current within the last either music within the last 20 years now and or artists who are still actively making music will be who will be being played. So, um, yeah, I'm super excited to have that 
to have that platform. And I, at least once a month, it will also sync up with my column for the Daily Memphian. So Look you'll get that. To Look at yeah. that synergy, this, the circle of life right there. That synergistic know, right? circle. Look at you. That was it's awesome. Perfect. <laughs> Well, I did do a podcast with uh, Jared Boyd, the program manager, and uh, who's been a, a writer for us, and is we are very happy just that he's kind of segueing, and he'll continue to write for us a little bit, but um, be mostly focused on the radio station. Robbie Grant, I think, technically executive editor, executive director, um, that give if people are listening to this podcast, they should go back and listen to that because um, it gave a bit of a taste of what's coming up with that in October. Um, Elizabeth, thanks, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Eric. Uh, that is all the time we have today. Be sure to subscribe to The Daily Memphian on the site for unlimited articles. Subscribe to this weekly podcast or the other Daily Memphian podcasts, including Behind the Headlines, Bill Dries' Politics podcast, Jennifer Biggs' Food podcast, our various sports podcasts. All of them are on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, The Daily Memphian site, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next week.